what is time? I'd like to understand what time is. The real problem with three-dimensional time is that we're so used to using three dimensions with spatial orientation that the obviousness of three dimensions of time is a little obscured. When we're moving through what we would think of as linear time, it's actually two dimensions of time, like the present moment of time, sort of perpendicular to period. Linear time would be sort of a vector, if you will, between present and period. We would then have a third dimension or a third component, so we would have present, period, and passage. So basically, here's your three-dimensional time model. The existence equations derive a three-dimensional construct regarding the nature of time. It appears we have successfully made the case for temporal dynamics. What about mass and how it relates to gravity? Enough is enough! I have had it with these monkey fight theories with one dimension of time. Everybody strap in! Our story begins in 1715 with the final controversy between the two great founders of calculus, the mathematics used in physics. Sir Isaac Newton, an English mathematician, philosopher, physicist, etc., and Gottfried Leibniz, a German mathematician, philosopher, physicist, etc. In November of 1715, Leibniz wrote his friend, the Princess of Wales, Caroline of Ansbach, criticizing the growing Newtonian view of natural philosophy. Stirring up trouble, the princess showed the letter to one of Newton's exponents, Samuel Clarke, a theologian philosopher, provoking what would become known as the leibniz clarke correspondence. This is to become one of the most significant philosophical debates of all time, and where our examination of the modern concepts of space and time unfold. In this correspondence, Clarke and apparently Newton alongside him took the position that space and time have a separate reality from objects and observation, existing independently of their own substance. Leibniz, on the other hand, took the position that space and time do not have a separate reality from objects only existing arbitrarily within the context of the relations between objects and observation. Leibniz's metaphysical principles assume that there is no absolute space and that space and time only exist throughout the relations between objects and observation. For Newton and Clock, space and time are absolutes. For Leibniz, space and time are just quantities. These gentlemen maintain, then, that space is a real absolute being, but this leads them into great difficulties. I object that space, taken as something real and absolute, without bodies, would be a thing eternal, where there are no parts, there neither extension nor shape is possible. Relative things have their quantities as well as absolutes. For example, ratios or proportions in mathematics have their quantity, and yet they are relations. 
Leibniz argument can be simplified to this example. Suppose there exist two universes. These two separate universes are exactly the same except they are shifted apart by some short distance x. According to Newton, the only way to know x is if both universes exist in absolute space. However, for Leibniz, there is no sufficient reason for why both universes would be x distance apart. And since both universes are identical, discerning the two would be nearly impossible. For Leibniz, Newton's concept of absolute space and time violate Leibniz's concept of the identity of indiscernibles. Newton's mathematical principle of natural philosophy assumes that there exists an absolute space, a substance like backdrop, within which physical phenomena occurs. Absolute space, in its own nature, without regard to anything external, remains always similar and immovable. Relative space is some movable dimension or measure of absolute space. Absolute true and mathematical time, of itself and from its own nature, flows equally without regard to anything external. Newton's particular spin regarding the issue of space and time is reduced to a bucket of water. By suspending a bucket of water and then spinning it, one can observe the surface of the water become concave as the water is pushed out towards the rim of the bucket. For Newton, this meant that in order for the water to become concave relative to the spinning motion of the bucket, it must be moving in relation to some background point of reference, an absolute frame of reference. Using the same line of reasoning in Clark's response to Leibniz, space is not bounded by bodies, but exists equally within bodies and around them. Space isn't enclosed between bodies; rather, bodies exist in unbounded space. Newton emphasizes this at length in his Mathematical Principles, from the consideration of the properties. Causes and effects of motion. He shows the difference between real motion, a body's being moved from one part of space to another, and relative motion, bodies merely undergoing a change with respect to one another. This argument is a mathematical one. It shows from real effects that there may be real motion in the absence of relative motion, and relative motion in the absence of real motion. The reality of space is proved by the above arguments, to which no answer has been given. In 1716, Gottfried Leibniz dies. The Newtonian ideas Leibniz worked so hard against would prevail after his death, and it wouldn't be for nearly two centuries that Newtonian natural philosophy would go unchallenged. The 19th-century physicist philosopher Ernst Mach did not accept the Newtonian explanation for why the spinning water became concave. For Mach, this indicated a connection between inertia and distant objects in the universe. If we imagine a universe where the only object in the universe is the spinning bucket, it would be impossible to detect the bucket's spinning motion. Therefore, it becomes hard to explain how the water still becomes concave. However, if something else existed with the bucket, say a distant star, then there would be something relative to the spinning bucket that could be used to measure the bucket's spin. Mach encapsulated this concept into Mach's principle: the investigator must feel the need of, say. Connections between the masses of the universe. There will hover before him as an ideal insight into the principles of the whole matter, 
from which accelerated and initial motions will result in the same way. Mach's principle would become instrumental to Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. He saw that Mach's principle indicated inertia originated from some sort of interaction between the masses of objects. On this point, Einstein's relativity would ultimately dethrone Newton's theory of gravity, replacing it with general relativity. The name theory of relativity is connected with the fact that motion from the point of view of possible experience always appears as the relative motion of one object with respect to another. Motion is never observable as motion with respect to space or as it has been expressed absolute motion. Einstein did not accept Newton's notion of absolute space. Physical objects are not in space, but these objects are spatially extended. In this way, the concept empty space loses its meaning. It is the essential achievement of the general theory of relativity that it has freed physicists from the necessity of introducing the inertial system. However, as successful as Einstein's relativity has been, it has never been able to completely consolidate with the other equally successful branch of physics, quantum mechanics, indicating that physics is incomplete. Einstein himself struggled to resolve this issue, seeking a complete theory of physics, a complete theory of everything. And so we find physics today, in the same situation, despite a cornucopia of new discoveries. General relativity and quantum mechanics remain mutually exclusive. However, Maybe Einstein's modification to Newtonian mechanics was not complete. Maybe something else, besides the curvature of space-time and the speed of light, was missing. When compared to a graph showing the effect of friction on an accelerated massive object, there is a short spike of energy required before the object moves then it does not take as much energy to maintain the object moving at a constant speed. Likewise, when an object comes to rest, it takes a period of time for the massive object to come to a stop. But something strange happens. When an object comes to rest, it wobbles to a complete stop. Initially, there was an issue raised which was avoided by Newton circumvented by Clark, which neither Mach nor Einstein address. This is the issue of Here's the Infinite Regress. The problem with Leibniz's view, ultimately, is that it leads to an infinite regression of inertial frames within frames within frames within frames. Which mathematically results in the sum of all relative motion as infinite, therefore immeasurable. This destroys the purpose of physics, which is to describe and predict motion. However, a solution to this apparent problem happens to be the central concept found in existics, whereby, ironically, existics is a mathematical solution to the problem of infinite regression. Existix uses a set of specific continued fractions to account for an infinite progression and regression of relative frames of reference. What's so startling is that rather than blowing up to infinity or collapsing down to zero, as it has been presumed to always happen, infinite series of relative frames of reference can converge to finite quantities. The existix model for infinite relative frames of reference is reconciliation between Newton's absolute space and Leibniz's relational quantities. So how does it apply to mass? As it turns out, the existix equations imply that time is multidimensional, which can be used to account for what mass is. 
Assume for a minute that Leibniz and Newton reconciled their distinct views and utilized the idea of multidimensional time. Where in Newton's laws of physics might it apply? Right here. The second law. Einstein correctly attacks this area, changing the inertial frame, also modifying the concept of energy and mass, made famous by his E equals mc squared equation. But despite all this, we are still left with a puzzle. What in the world is mass? This is the big question for the 21st century thinkers, because it has become the kingpin issue around which the unsolved puzzles in physics revolve.